and so in this section I'm going to continue talking about the upper limb of the human body um, in the last section I obviously discussed the rotator the bones of the upper limb from the scapula the clavicle and indeed the humerus for mainly focusing on the proximal humerus and today I'm actually going to look at the muscles, the anterior muscles that attach the, the upper limb to the axial skeleton and then um, also look at the roots of the brachial plexus and indeed the axillary um, artery. So I, what I aim to do is to focus mainly on the anterior surface of the upper limb um, the muscles at the appendicular skeleton and into the axial skeleton and then in the next section I'll focus on the posterior aspect of the upper limb um, basically the rhomboids, latimus, latissimus dorsi um, and, um, and, uh, and um, yes the rhomboids, latissimus dorsi and the and the teres minor in major, how they insert into the scapula, and then then focus basically on both the upper limb, the the arm, and the forearm, and hopefully uh, then I'll feel like I've covered the the upper limb sufficiently to then focus on pathologies, uh, specifically rheumatoid rheumatology pathologies. Um, so today this section will focus on um, anterior muscles of uh, the pectoral girdle. I wanted to make a, a personal statement but then I think I shouldn't uh, because obviously yesterday was a a bit of a difficult day for me um, in knowing you know what's happening on the 21st of August uh, that other people are getting on with, their, with uh, everything really um, but anyway let's focus on this so the scapula itself has so the upper limb has four joints these are which I which I, I demonstrated using the using the model before, but then these joints are the sternoclavicular joint, which is an anteriorly. So this is the sternoclavicular joint, which is a true articulation. Another true articulation is the um acromioclavicular and then the cleano humeral which is obviously the way the proximal humerus inserts into the cleano cavity of the scapula and another articulation that we that we that we say the articulation even though it's not a true joint is the scapula thoracic which um, holds the scapula um, and stabilizes it to the uh, thoracic cage so it is a posterior joint so the true joints are these ones and um, well, while I'm here, I'll just you know very very quickly talk about what a joint, what joints are. For example, especially the the glenal humeral joint, which um is a ball and socket joint. Synovial. And what we mean by synovial joint is that it has synovial fluid and obviously that is important for pathologies such as um, adhesive capillar, capillar capsulitis which is the frozen shoulder so it is important for that but very quickly really 
when you talk about a joint, um, we, we just mean that two bones come together. For example, in here, I'll just, you know, just draw a general bone, say a knee joint, because the knee joint is so much easier to, to show, um, to use as a demonstration for what a joint is. So a knee joint will have a cartilage there. The cartilage is the surface that um, covers the articular surface. And then from the cartilage, cart cartilages can have pathologies such as inflammation, uh, degradation leading to osteoarthritis, which I'll look at as I as I proceed into the rheumatoid into the rheumatology aspect of um, of orthopedics and rheumatology um, talks. So um, a joint. So this would be a bone, and this is, this again is a bone, and then a bone. A, a, a two bones in order to form a joint will have. A capsule, well, not a capsule really, a ligament that uh, attaches both bones and um, joins the two bones together. And usually, in a synovial joint, especially, there will also be a cap. So, this is cartilage. There will also be a capsule which really lines the ligament. So this will be the in blue, this will be a capsule which really lines the the interior aspect of the ligament and in here will be the synovial fluid. And again this is you know a model that's true for the ball and socket synovial joint. So this is just a demonstration of what a synovial joint is. But indeed, a ball and socket means that um, there is a cavity, which is articulation surface, and then the ball of the of the of the uh, bone that that then joins into that um, articulation surface. And again. In terms of uh, the shoulder joint, a poorly drawn shoulder joint, or this is the scapula, you know, the ca the capsule will be I uh, will arise from the neck of the scapula to the anatomical neck of the to the anatomic neck of the humerus, which is a very poorly drawn humerus anyway. So it will be, you know, this will be our capsule and there will be a synovial fluid in there. So this will be a ball and socket joint. And this will be the uh, anatomic neck of the humerus, the neck of the scapula. So this is the scapula. And indeed the surgical, you know. And indeed the surgical neck of the, of the uh, humerus. So in a, in a joint, so they will have a, a capsule which encloses the synovial fluid insi inside a joint. And the synovial fluid really keeps the joint lubricated, reduces stress and tension, and re also reduces friction. It absorbs friction in when a joint is moving because joints really are mobile and allow us to perform um, actions so the cups the capsule will then have um you know a ligament which joins to the outer you know on the outer surface will be lined by a ligament and the ligament really joins two bones together
bones will then also have tendons. So this would be a tendon which attaches the muscle to bone. So this is a muscle to, to the bone. And obviously when, when I move on to talking about pathologies, I will talk about pathologies such as tendinitis and, you know, inflammation of ligaments. And again, things like osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis which will which really mostly will affect um the cartilage um you know causing degradation or degeneration of the cartilage then causing uh pathologies such as uh, osteoarthritis where there is reduced space between the cartilage and um, then um you know causing pain to arise from that because really the cartilage is again a shock absorber and allows the bone to move with less friction so I just really wanted to very ever so quickly because we, I keep talking about joints to say what a joint is and to demonstrate what it looks like with a simplified diagram of what a joint is so now we know that the glenohumeral joint is a ball and socket joint that's also a synovial joint which means that it has synovial fluid um, I'm now going to move on to discussing the muscles which um, is uh, the, one of the main topics uh, that I'm discussing today so the muscles that um, that are found at the anterior aspect of the of the of the upper limb really only focusing on the pectoral girdle itself are the subclavius subclavius muscle and the subclavius muscle really is i think sometimes it's important to just have the model the only sad thing about the model is that it takes up when he re, when he comes here he takes up so much room in terms of I need to put him somewhere where he can be seen properly. So the subclavius muscle lies just under the clavicle there. I need a pen. I'll just get a pen from my desk. So the subclavius muscle lies just under the clavicle there and it attaches at the top of the first rib well yes at the top of the first rib there and on the medial and inferior aspect of the clavicle and extends to for, so from under the from the top from the posterior aspect of the first rib to the medial aspect of half of the clavicle and its job really is to protect is to is to hold the clavicle in place really and also to elevate and depress the clavicle and also to protect the um subclavian arteries and subclavian vessels including and also the um brachial plexus the nerves that as they arise and emerge from the from the opening of the upper thoracic cage so it, it inserts at the first rib just on the superior border and the medial border of the of the inferior surface of the clavicle and this job really is to is to elevate 
and depress the clavicle. See his clavicle, and also to protect subclavian vessels. Subclavian. Sub, oh. And um, the the trunks really and core trunks of brachial plexus. In um in cases of um you know a clavicular fracture. And clavicular fractures is important to stress that are much common in children and they are usually due to a fall or to a blunt force trauma. So that is the first, uh, the first muscle that's found in the anterior surface of the pectoral girdle. The second muscle Um, again, I'm going to start uh, from the deeper surface and then move subcutaneously. It makes sense to me to do it that way. So the second muscle that I'm going to talk about is the sartorius. Sartorius. Anterior. I'm sure I've spelled it wrong. Sartorius anterior. And Sartorius anterior inserts into the first eight ribs. So it's rib one to eight. So it will be these ribs. Um, rib one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So it inserts at the actual ribs, right at the border of the of, of their costal cartilages, so it will insert there. With the, so it will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, and it will extend over the all of that anterior and lateral surface of the thoracic cage, all the way. To the lateral aspect and it would have been really useful to have been able to um, be to, to dislocate um, the this um, scapula and then show that eventually it inserts at the medial border of the scapula there but more internally in terms of um, not at the ex not, not at the external surface of the scapula but at the internal surface of the scapula where subscapularis arises. So it's going to be actually there at the medial border of the scapula. So from ribs one to eight at the costal at the costal cartilage angle, costal cartilage angles. And 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 it's it's, it's, a, it's a very big muscle obviously that runs all the way across the you know from there all the way across that lateral aspect of the thoracic cage into the posterior aspect of the thoracic cage to insert at the lateral border of the at the medial border of the scapula I'm ever so sorry. And um, however, not not, at the, not from the posterior surface, but indeed from the subscapularis surface. So it will arise from the anterior aspect of the ribs and insert at the medial of the scapula and inferior angle of the scapula as well, inferior angle of the scapula.
and indeed when i when i say media border i mean you know where sub scapularis la sub scapularis muscle lies so this is how i i, I remember it and um so the Taurus anterior, you know, when we think about weight in sets, weight arising in sets, its job really is to retract the scapula. And um it's it you you in it, you can test it clinically to see, you know, if um if if um it's intact if it's working well. And usually when we test it really, what we're actually testing is the long thoracic nerve, the function of the long thoracic nerve, which um you know if it is not functioning properly, say in if someone has a I don't know, mononeuritis, perhaps a viral infection that affects the long thoracic nerve. So what happens is that a person will end up with a winged scapula. And a winged scapula really just means that the laxity, there will be laxity on uh, the function of um, the satorus anterior. And because uh, it tethers the scapula onto that um, scapulothoracic joint, which is here, obviously, this is the joint that I'm talking about. So because it actually tethers um, or, you know, stabilizes that, shall I just write here, stabilizes, stabilizes the, um, the scapulothoracic, thoracic joint. So when it's not functioning, due to um, a problem with the long thoracic nerve. Due to a problem with the long thoracic nerve, then we have a winged scapula. And what that means is that the scapula looks as though it is detached from the thoracic cage and it and its medial border becomes much more prominent because the torus anterior is not doing its job of keeping that joint together and stabilizing it. So the scapula retracts from the thoracic cage and gives an appearance of a winged scapula. And that becomes more prominent. So if you say to someone, you know, push against the wall, you know, with outstretched arms like that, and then push against the wall. So a winged scapula will then become more prominent. I haven't got one, so that will not happen. But then if someone in clinic, if someone wants to push against the wall, that winged scapula, that pathology of a winged scapula will become more prominent, which means that there is um a, a problem with Satoras anterior. Did I actually call it Satoras anterior? Which means that there is a problem with Satoras anterior. I'm sure I've spelled it wrong anyway, so forgive the spelling today. Um, so Satoras anterior is the deepest muscle lying right against uh, the ribs, the first eight ribs, and inserting into the medial border of the scapula. And then from Satoras and, and um, it retracts the scapula and stabilizes that joint, the scapula thoracic joint, and it leads to a winged scapula if there is pathology specific to, a, to the long thoracic nerve, which is in, innervated by. And then from Serratus anterior, the next um, muscle group uh, that um, lies deep, well, deeper than, you know, the, the muscles that are more on the surface will be um, pectoralis minor. And pectoralis minor lies on ribs, one, two, three, four, five, between ribs, Three to five, one, two, three, one, two, three. So it's there. 
So just those three ribs really lies there and it inserts at the curry cord process. So it will just, you know, it's a triangular shaped muscle and these bases are just on those three um, cartilages. So it will, it it's, um, arises from ribs three to five again cause at the costal angle at the joining of that costal angle at the costal cartilages to the actual bony ribs so joining of costal cartilages to ribs and it insets its uh, coracoid, coracoid process. And again, its job, its function is to stabilize the, sh the, the joint shoulder. Main function, I should say, all of these are main function. They have other minor functions, but I've most, I mainly focus on the main function stabilization of shoulder joint so pectoralis minor is innervated by C5 and um, C6 whereas um, serratus anterior is innervated by the long thoracic nerve which arises from C5, C6 and C7 and then from pectoralis minor, we have pectoralis major. And pectoralis major, oh, let's see, blue. Pectoralis major arises from the anterior sternum from the anterior aspect it's a, it's a it's a very very big muscle so it arises from the anterior aspect of the sternum and inserts it has insertions on the clavicle I need to find the humerus of this of this uh, needle oh dear oh I will use the other one so it arises from the sternum it has insertions at the clavicle, but its main insertion really is at the intertubercular, intertubercular fossa of the humerus. So it's it's a it's a very big muscle that obviously covers all the costal cartilages and the ribs. It lies in front of them. To insert at the um, at the inter this is obviously the intertubercle, but more distally, you know, it is more distal um, aspect there, just there at the inferior lip. Some 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 books say, so it 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 covers that entire aspect of the thoracic wall. And um, so it's from sternum, the insertion, and clavicle. It also inserts into the aponeurosis of uh, the abdominal muscles. Actually, I forgot about that. Clavicle and aponeurosis. Aponeurosis of abdominal, rectus abdominalis, I think, from year three. Uh, I haven't. Obviously, done year three stuff. I'm not going to do year three stuff, but uh, aponeurosis of abdominal muscles. And it inserts into the humor. Into inter tubercle groove. Like the 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 lower 
lip. So in terms of always, this is the greater tubercle and this is the lesser tubercle. So really, we're just saying the lower lip there. And it's it's a uh, it's function. Its main functions. It's a very strong muscle. The uh, pectoralis major is a very strong muscle, and its main function is to is to re, um um okay, protract the scapula so it will protract and it will also internally rotate internally rotate the arm which uh, also means it will adapt that Which means it will also attack the arm. So, um, so pectoralis ma major is the most superior of the muscles. It overlays all the other deep muscles that I talked about, including pectoralis minor and serratus anterior, and um, you know it's the, it covers the the last the. The anterior muscles of the axial appendicular scalus that I'm going to talk about today. And really, I think while I'm here, it's just important to also mention that its insertion point is also the insertion point of teres major. Um, and, um, you know, because it inserts there, really. And then teres major inserts there. And uh, the deltoid uh, muscle will in insert at the at the deltoid tuberosity. There. So those are the three muscles which will, which will insert into the um, the the humeral shaft. So now I have discussed uh, the muscles of the uh, the anterior muscles of the pectoral girdle. I'm now going to very quickly look at the at the brachial plexus, how it arises up to its cords, and then I'll then finally look at the. Um, and then finally, we'll look at the arteries, specifically the axial artery, the axillary artery. I, don't, I can't believe I said axial artery. So obviously, the formation that the muscles cause will be the, you know, if we, if we were to go back to what they do, you know, pec major will form the anterior aspect of the axilla and then serratus anterior because it lies its fibers lie there so it will form and and also and they also um you know obviously this 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 is more like the trapezius muscle but serratus anterior is there as well so serratus I think I need to I need to fo focus on this spelling serratus anterior will form